Okay, so yeah, if you've tuned in, and you should be tuning in, uh, and we'll be taking questions if I can see them. Uh, I don't always have the. I noticed the last time we talked, we had some questions, Ken, but I didn't. I, I didn't see them during our talk. So uh, maybe I'll be able to see them. I don't. I didn't turn it off or anything. I, I don't know where it's at. But anyway, so it's uh, Christoph Kluxen and Ken O'Neill in. 2019, baby, new year, new thing, new thrills, uh, new shape of things to come. And uh, we're going to talk about a few different things as we normally do. And we're going to probably start out with uh, what is the state of JKD in 2019? And what does – would, or what would Bruce Lee think about the state of JKD at this point? And when, what does Ken think about it, and what do I think about it? So you're going to hear the our idea of what Bruce would think, and then you're going to hear our idea, probably go somewhere else. And if you got questions, and if I, yeah, I'll try to see them. Uh, I, I have to look at this thing a little bit more, make sure. But if you got questions, put them in there, and we'll get to it. But anyway, uh, so Ken. Uh, for one thing, I never, I, I never envisioned 2019. Did you ever envision that many years ago? Did you ever see, think about the year 2019? <laughs> no, I figured I'd be dead way before then. I really did. I didn't think I'd make it much past 40, if, if that. I did too many crazy things, so I thought, you know, a lot of deep dives, and you know, I figured I'd probably die of the bends or something, if not something yeah. else. Did you ever get? Did you ever get the bends or anything? No, but uh, I was on a. I did a mixed gas dive in the Caymans. It was like 240 feet on night dive, and uh, a gal who was a very experienced underwater photographer back in those days. That was in the 80s. She uh, or was it in the 80s? No, later than that. I can't remember. Anyway, she did. She not not on that particular dive, but. A few months later, there was a big article on that she had she she goofed, you know. You know, when you combine repetitive dives with flying, it's a big 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 problem, you know. You can't do it right. You're that supposed is. to wait at least twenty. You she it, made right? miscal miscalculations in the tables and and uh, yeah, she got the bends really bad, and they couldn't get her to a recompression chamber too. She was a really cool, really cute, really experienced dive dive gal she was a underwater photographer and uh that was just a shame to see that happen but yeah I, I used to do a lot of that kind of crazy stuff and i was always afraid to get stuck in caves or in a wreck or something and run out of air you know so i i was always figuring i might not make it but here we are regardless of all that here we are so yeah, yeah. i just feel like, I, I don't think i ever thought much past 2000 you know i mean <laughs> leading up to thousand because that was such a big deal you know millennium uh, and for those millennials they don't understand any of this but man everybody there was all the doomsday thing and it was pretty huge wasn't it in the 90s there was like from like 94 on until 2000 happened there was increasing doomsday things and everybody there was remember the big y2k computer crash that was going to happen and and uh there were people stocking up preppers you know before preppers yeah. became i mean i mean there's always been preppers obviously but yeah uh, i mean prep prepping is a huge thing i know hey i noticed by the way that there's whole programs about preppers now on on national geographic or whatever or discovery national geographic pretty bizarre because they were always considered fringe and now i guess they're not there's money to be made in that field so that's why they're getting tv but Leading from that, um, yeah, I bet Bruce never thought about 2019. <laughs> but what do you think of, um, of the state of JKD in 2019? Well, except for a few people that I know of, it seems like it's pretty much non-existent because, you know, you see all these little JKD groups online and stuff, but really what they're – when I look at them and listen to what they're saying, it's it's they're really talking about Jun Fan kickboxing, you know, uh, especially the other, mainly the other guys in St. Louis, that other group that came after us. They're 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 it's like they're preservationists, you know. They're they're just mimicking what Bruce personally used to do, and they don't they don't have Bruce's attributes to to do it at a high level. Plus, that's 
that was just part of his evolution. I mean, that wasn't where things were supposed to stay static. I mean, you know, you and I talk about this all the time, but JKD is a process. It's not, it's not a specific way of, 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 uh, that's codified where you're just doing, uh, your front kick this way, you know, or your, your hook or round kick this way. It's that, that, that's in the past. I mean, now it's, you know, it's about, it's about learning what works for you and, and, um, you know, sharing that with other people and teaching them the process on how to analyze and, and evaluate stuff and basically create their own personal style, you know, and who that's a lot of work, you know, it's a lot of work to do that. Uh, because you're, you're leading people and coaching them, but they, they have to do a lot of work too. And I think that's part of the problem also because it's, it's commercially a tough thing to do because how, you know, most people just want to be led like sheep and they want to line up in a line and, you know, one, two, you know, do their reverse punches or whatever. And somebody's telling them what to do every second, but holy cow, JKD's high responsibility to really do it because you, you're creating your own art. You're, you got to be highly involved and, and understand that process. So to me, when I look around at, at JKD guys, there's a few guys I've seen. One's in South Korea, you know, but there's a few guys I see who who are doing that, you know, from what I can tell that are that are making it evolve, doing something uh, creative with it. They're not just trying to mimic old Junfan kickboxing, which is still what I think most people are doing. If there's Wing Chun elements in there at all, you're you're mimicking old style. Because Bruce would dump that stuff himself, basically, you know. So, are you a preservationist or are you really doing JKD? And if you say you're doing Jun Fan kickboxing, then you got to be careful because you might get in legal trouble with Linda Lee. So, <laughs> I don't think these guys understand the definition of the term that much, that well. Most of them. Uh, uh, you bring up some interesting points because there are a lot of people. Uh, who argue this very thing? Wing Chun is there? Was Bruce doing? And uh, these guys, of course, are people who never—they never obviously train with Bruce, but they never trained with someone who trained with Bruce. You know, so they're far down the road, and they're trying to basically they're trying to project their what the, their wishes and stuff onto a historical fact. And what I know because I trained with. With Gene LaBelle, <laughs> I know that Bruce was moving more and more towards grappling things because of the fact that when you hit someone, you never know. Like, you don't know, right? Because some people can take a better punch or kick than other people. And as a professional fighter, I definitely know that. Uh, but when you lock up on somebody's arm or you, have, you put them in a neck crank, you know and they know. I mean, and that's that was the thing. Uh, Gene LaBelle called, fin calls it finishing holes, and they definitely are finishing holes. There's no, there's no question. When you got a, somebody in a finishing hole, they know it. Uh, the some people, of course, if you're choking them, yeah, you choke them out. They're still struggling until they get choked out. But Gene LaBelle has a saying, and it's pretty good. Uh, when in doubt, choke them out, which is not is was. Different. Now, I am not advocating that everything be about grappling. I'm just saying that Bruce was moving into a component part that he lacked. He didn't have grappling anywhere else. And you can find Dan and Asanto talking about that very factor. Like they did very rudimentary uh, grappling. You know, you don't, not saying that you need grappling in every situation, but it's good to have, if you're going to be uh, a JKD guy, you need to explore many different things and find out what fits your style, as we're talking about. And and one of the things that you also brought up and that I, I will echo is that when you see people teaching JKD, most of them couldn't fight their way out of the bathroom, uh, number one. Number two, they teach patterns, as we know and hate, and that's not what it's about. It should be a one-on-one. -on -one. And JKD actually the way combat JKD really is if you're really gonna do it it's a one-on-one -on -one training and that so that takes a lot of intensive commitment for both people the person who's the instructor and from the person who's learning and the instructor has to learn you personally to understand what motivates you because every person is there are some global things uh, that we know will work but 
application is varied every time with a different person. And that's what I think makes it. And that's why Bruce gave up on that whole idea about commercializing it yeah. because uh, commercializing it was uh, you're talking about one on one training. It can't be commercialized like that. Not if you're really trying, if you care about the person development, it, it's, it's different. And that's also where I see, but it's also a limitation of JKD because you're doing it that. Does that mean that there aren't other ways to train people? No, there are other ways because I do it with military. Yeah. Commando training is all about. Uh, but sticking with now, the uh, what I I feel and and I agree that you got you still got people you know what was Bruce doing in '67 or '69 and he you know he's doing the builds. Who cares? For the stuff, number one, are you stopping punches? Uh, you know, are you getting out of the way of a kick? Uh, and believe me, Wing Chun has a million holes, and and these guys are always saying, "Well, you have never seen." It's called the true Scotsman <laughs> uh, false logic. They're trying to tell me I've never seen a real Wing Chun guy because a real Wing Chun guy could stop this stuff. No, he can't. Is this flaws built in? The low line is why. They don't stop takedowns. They can't stop uh, upper body Greco. Uh, they, yeah, the headbutts, all sorts of stuff will nail them. Uh, and the same thing with uh, the when Bruce was doing uh, when he was doing the gung fu, the gung fu part uh, before he got to the Jun Fan when he was doing the gung. Fu, there's lots of holes in that. And what we're talking about is where Bruce was at with that, with the Jun Fon, the kickboxing part, because he started realizing that he needed boxing skills, and he started doing a whole lot of boxing. And he had people that he was training who had been boxers, uh, right, like James Lee, right? James Lee was had been a boxer. Uh, and that's why Ted Wong does all this stuff that's boxing-related. And when he was training – that period of time he trained Joe Lewis, the karate guy, was kickboxing. You know, well, U.S. sense of kickboxing, not kickboxing as in the Thai sense or in the Japanese or the Burmese. It wasn't even Savat, which better in a lot of better. In, in, I don't know how far I want to go off into that, but Savat, the box. Paul says different. Although Bruce looked at some things, didn't mean he ever, you know, did it in deep. In deep. But the, that full contact—that's what it really was. Full contact that Bill Wallace and, and Joe Lewis was early days in the U.S. Early days, and the rules made a lot of stuff very bizarre. Uh, and there's holes in that too. But what what are we getting to? is that this was just a, a snapshot of a time period. <clears throat> but everybody's seemingly hanging on to that time period. Uh, yeah. Or they're doing or they're doing this, let's combine a bunch of stuff in there. Like let's put in uh, let's put in Filipino martial arts, <laughs> which they which is basically mostly and the guys that he brought to the the, let's also take in some Silat, you know, well, Silat from certain people because Silat's a Muslim art and it will not train non-Muslims. So <coughs> if you really think you're doing Silat and you're not a Muslim, <coughs> you're not. You're doing some some version of it. It's not. And uh, people will tell you in Indonesia and Malaysia that, yeah, you got to be a Muslim, Muslim to, to – that doesn't mean anything either. It doesn't mean that it's some cool, superior art at all. It's just there are, there are so many ways that a human being can move. There's so many ways that a human being can sit. There well, is something. Yeah, that, we're back to that. You know what? One thing I wanted to say so I don't lose it, but back to the idea of the commercial <laughs> model of this. You know, in a funny way, the one karate school that I ever saw – that maybe had the closest model to how they ran their school that could have worked for JKD was Tracy's Karate. I don't know if you remember those guys. They were pretty big. They're still yeah. a couple of years. Yeah. But the, yeah. their model was that basically you were buying private lessons. 
So you had one-on-one -on -one time with the instructor, which made sense. And then you also, for that fee, you were able to come to group classes during the week to train what you learned in the privates. That was smart. Now, that would be how the JKD thing would, would have worked better commercially. But then again, you still, you still have to have pretty exemplary instructors who could handle, you know, really still, you know, being able to get in and really look at a guy and analyze what his physical limitations are, how to compensate for all that stuff. I mean, you, you know, you still, it'd be hard having enough instructors because they, they've got to be above and beyond somebody who can just memorize moves and teach the moves. So, you know, that, that would, but, but that was a closer model, I think, to how it could have worked because they, that was their big focus was on the private lessons and they, it still is, is my understanding. So that, that part would have been and back to the grappling thing, you know, yeah, that was part of the evolution. I mean, Look how Bruce, look how they opened that scene and Enter the Dragon, man. It went to grappling really fast. And I always heard that that was, that that was deliberate on Bruce's part as partly as an homage to, to Gene LaBelle kind of opening him up more about, about the importance of all that, you know. So my, my bet would be that what would have come next for Bruce after high proficiency there would have been uh, a larger focus on how to escape from the ground fighting. You know, I think that would have been the next natural step in that evolution. I remember Jay D'Amato, when he was out going, going to California every week for years, training with the Machados back in, when was this? This would have been, I guess, the early 90s or mid 90s. And he ran into Dan and Asano out there and he hadn't seen Dan for a few years. And Dan said, Jay, what are you doing here? And Jay says, well, I've been coming out here every week. What are you doing here? And they started talking. And, you know, one of the things apparently that Dan told Jay was he's like, uh, yeah, a lot of what I'm doing here is really understanding this so I can learn how now how do you how do you escape from this? So, you know, it, I'll give Dan credit there. He was thinking that way, too, which to, would be to me how a JKD guy would think. It's like, yeah, understand what these guys are doing, but then understand how to how to escape from this happening. I mean, you're, you're always trying to get to that to that opposite place, you know, not not being stuck somewhere, but learning how to go past. And then I also think the next progression, a big uh, progression in Bruce's would have been more multiple attacker work and armed multiple attacker work, I would suspect would have been part of the evolution. And, uh, you know, if, if everybody finishes reading that, that new book that just came out, you know, Bruce was no stranger to firearms either. His original group, some of those, one of those guys was in the military in particular, but, you know, they taught Bruce a lot. And he used to like to shoot. You know, I'm sure that would have come out. You and I were talking about this offline, but there probably would have been a, a, a bunch of extensive uh, uh, handgun work, I'm guessing, that would have eventually come into it and, and disarming. And I suspect all those things would have been part of the evolution had it continued. Um, I agree with your, what you're saying. Get yeah, that grappling. In fact, I actually have. <laughs> Too deep anti grappling. So if you can do what you spent your time at, you spent more time striking, which is what JKD is, more striking than anything else. Then you can try to retain that. Uh, and I and as John Saylor, former Olympic judo national coach, said, it's a lot easier to develop a world class sprawl than it is a world class takedown. You know, it takes a lot less time to be able to stop the guy who's trying to do the takedown than it is to get the to develop that takedown that's incredible, which is uh, very important. That's uh, I think that Bruce would have done that. I do believe that when you're talking about the weapon into the weapons, and I don't mean the uh, antiquated, outdated stuff, uh, the, the Chinese butterfly swords and all that, the, the yeah, yeah. long spear. Yeah, he wouldn't have wasted his time. No, he would have done. I think he would have done more knife things. Yeah, and I, and I definitely agree. With, I definitely agree. He would have gone into handguns, and he because he, he could back then. Though, I mean, handgun technology and shooting has improved uh, technically a whole lot since that time. I mean, there were great shooters back then, but as far as teaching it, the way you do it uh, tactically has changed a whole lot since those times. So it would have been interesting. I think it would have been interesting because that's part of it. You know, fighting is not – is about – he was about fighting and violence, not 
the ring, not the symmetrical ring stuff, uh, which I think a lot of people lose sight of because they yeah. get involved in MMA and or they they think about they think about Muay Thai or they think about JKD in the same way that hey it's about two guys doing skills that they have certain things or and there's certain you're going to be in a certain situation you're going to be wearing non restrictive clothing you're going to be on a flat surface you're going to be able to see everything that is not what Bruce was about originally you know. And everybody loses sight of that. They all train in these well lit. Well, you don't. You and I don't. Well, we know that's a thing too, right there. Like that's a good. It's not a tangent. That's something to bring up. Like how many of these guys have you seen who are doing supposedly JKD? How many of them are training in the same environments you and I are training? Training people in. Do you see anybody training in the mud in JKD? Do you see them training in the snow? Do you, you see them uh, training in the dark? Uh, yeah, the entire you, class is blindfolded even. You know, I mean, you know, that. yeah, I mean, right. That's You don't see it. If they're doing it, they're hiding it. <laughs> well, even, you know, I can think of, I'm thinking of the reason I'm stalling here is I'm thinking of actual people and, and replaying some of their training I've seen. And I have not seen it. I've seen them put blindfolds on people just for some sort of deprivation thing, but they haven't ever really – they've never really done attacks in low light. That's what you're going to face, you know. And so that's where the MMA, the Muay Thai, the Hop Keto, all that stuff falls apart. Because these are situations and environments that people have not trained for. And I think that's what Bruce would have done. Bruce would have gone more like what we call nowadays, we term it situational training, which you and I both know very well because that's what Mike Sandlin was all about, <laughs> was putting you in situations and seeing what's going to happen. The, yeah. I think that's where Bruce would have really learned to that. Uh, and because of the the, inc the increases in uh, technology, like they were using armor as be as best they could, you know. And I think that he would have he would have increased the, the the armor for his guys. He would have put the guy his attackers in better armor so that they could uh, withstand more punishment. And that would have increased a lot of things as far as learning what techniques work better and which do not. There's a lot of people who over rely on that sidekick, and that sidekick, that JKD sidekick is really something that's is should be tossed out. It doesn't. It's too. It you commit yourself too much. It does, and it's very hard to hit a moving target with that. Uh, I'm talking low line, uh, and you leave yourself very vulnerable if you miss or if they grab you. You're you're screwed. It's too. It's too much of a. It's the same thing uh, as, in a way, as the lunge that you do in foil fencing. In foil fencing, the lunge is everything, right? That's because there's rules and they're very light weapons. But in real dueling, you will not. No one ever did lunges. No one did lunges in real dueling. If you commit too much, it's too wide open. Real weapons are much heavier. Uh, you have to knock them off. Dueling dueling weapons had to be knocked offline. You just can't avoid the sword like you can in foil. So that's the same that's the same thing that that you find if you had body armor on. And that same thing with I was talking about what do you think about the JKD sidekick? I threw it out. I, I, I think it doesn't work. I think it, it's too risky. There are better things and it's uh, it takes a lot of time to develop it number one. It yeah. won't work against someone who's moving around very well. I mean, you have to be great at it. Plus, the footing, it's all in movies and stuff, but it's not really something you can apply. And there are going to be people who say, well, you don't know how to apply it. Really? Because, uh, you know, I was a professional boxer <laughs> for a long time. And what were you guys? Comment on it. Were you? Tell me your, how many professional fights you guys had. I'm telling you that. I threw it out. I don't. I did. I quit training it. I quit teaching people it. I don't yeah. use it. 
Uh, what do you think? What do you think of that as far as JKD? Oh yeah, I mean, uh, when you look at how long it took to develop that, you know, I could take people off their feet with that kick. I mean, I worked it hard enough. You know, through through a, a, a an inflated air shield too, not just foam. But I could take a guy my weight or a little heavier. I could get them airborne. I could get them uh, off their feet and on their back. And Stan could too back in the day. But um, for what it took to develop that and maintain it, and then you know, if a guy even gets an inkling that that thing is coming, it's so linear. I mean, just a simple twist and the thing slides right past your gut. I mean, it, it was way too much time to develop and, and maintain it. Plus, if you didn't have the space to do it, you know, I mean, in general, you know, kicking anywhere but low is asking for getting your leg cut up or, or your leg grabbed. It's, it's, you see it fail too often as you're, when you're testing that stuff. You know, that's why, I think that's why more combative arts that are not sport they they kicking gets more minimal, you know. It gets it gets smaller, it gets closer in, it gets more camouflaged, and it's low line, like you just said. You know, it's you don't see the big fancy kicks because it takes too much to maintain I, them. I, I, yeah. Well, now in the movie, J, let, we also got to talk about the fact that the movie JKD was not what Bruce would have really done. He was throwing high yeah. kicks because he could throw high kicks, and we'll tell you too that Bruce would high kicks. He wasn't going to use high kicks to fight with. Um, and so, yeah, the, the point is that uh, I agree. There's a whole different, like this is one of the stuff I do with the commando training is because there are strikes, there's sports strike, and then there's war strikes. And the same thing with kicking. There is kicking and everybody's doing some sort of sport kicking, really. Tiger Taekwondo or Muay Thai, they're both sword kicking. They're not doing war kicking. And it's got to be because you can't, and I said, the side, that sidekick, the JKD sidekick, is too much commitment. It's too easy. It's too, too get uh, countered. Uh, and you and you got a bad problem, too. It's not like uh, you throw it and you fired a shot off in the dark. No, it's like you're right there on their doorstep, and you're out of, and you got a musket loader, and you're you're out of ammo. How bad you are in that situation. So, uh, yeah, I I think Bruce would have dumped it. Is what I'm getting to. I think Bruce would have dumped that sidekick. Yeah. Oh, I do. Even though he was good at it, you know, even though he's good at it, I think he would dumped it. The. Uh, I mean, uh, I, I mean, yeah, yeah, it took. I remember spending all that time with Mike doing that. I had that same. Those are the old, those old football shields, those air air shields. Yeah. That's what yeah. we used to use. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I did all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. I got one in storage still. I still got one in storage. Yeah, it's got a it's got a car inner tube inside of it. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. Yep. Fire yeah, it's what the foot football used to do for blocking. Those are for blocking practice. So yeah. I think Dan's the one that inter introduced those to Bruce because he had been a football coach, I, I yeah. remember, at high school or something. Yeah. So, uh, so I mean, that, that's my point. The, what I was going to was the technology's improved, the training equipment. As you get better tools, you get better. That's one of the things like what I do in the commando stuff. All of our stuff, our tools are so good. Our war bags, our war posts, our trenching tires, all those stuff – allows people to get phenomenally good very fast because you have the right tools. Same thing if you if you're trying to work on a on a computer, you need the right tools to take the thing apart. If you're trying to work on your car, tools, car. Uh, and so it's the same thing. Like these are the things that a lot of people don't know. They don't think about. They're like, I'm gonna go learn uh, Wing Chun. And when they use that wooden that's their big tool. But there are better things. And the same thing, you know, when you learn sports stuff, they use a heavy bag. But a heavy bag is a sport training device. We use things that are much different. And I won't go into that. If you're interested, you can come to our training that we do, that I do. Uh, and that's all, and I should mention that's on combat-judo.com. There's information there about our about uh, our different trainings. And, and, oh, and before I forget, because this kind of fits into things about – how things would evolve. Uh, you got, you have a, you call them workshops, right? You got a workshop 
When is it? What date is it? Next weekend? When yeah, is it? The twenty seventh, next Sunday. Yeah. Yeah, we'll be and, in a nice big uh, uh, Aikido dojo for that because I have too many people for the house. So it's a nice space. The guy just the guy that's uh, it's the old Three Rivers Aikido, you know, that's been around for years, and they just moved into a much gigantic space. I mean, it, it'll easily hold a hundred people on the mat. It's and it's really nice. So I gotta have access to what, that. What's the address? If people are interested. What's the time? What's the address? So people. It's uh. Shoot, it's 30, 2320 Marconi Avenue in St. Louis. It's in the area they call the Hill, the Italian, old Italian neighborhood, uh, next to the Bocce Ball Club. It's uh, it's a huge space. It's an old in, uh, industrial space, but he's it's he's fixed it up really nice. It's one of the. It's what one, is the what, what time are you doing it? Eleven to three. It's just four. It's four hours. It's knife defense. Okay, so it's mostly knife defense work. Okay. On the Yeah, so 11 to 3 on the 27th of January, 2019. That's a Sunday. Yep. Uh, it's at the address that you said. Uh, you can contact uh, Ken on his Facebook, Ken O'Neill. Or uh, I don't always get to all the messages people send me on the things uh, below these cause comments because I got so many videos <laughs> that I don't I don't always check them, but. You can you can definitely contact me on my Facebook, and I'll give you Ken's. If you can't find Ken, you can find me, and I'll give you his thing. Because if you want to go to it, it's so it's a four hours on the twenty seventh of January on a Sunday. Starts at eleven, gets done at three, and it's about the knife defense. If you're on the ground, correct? Is that yeah. what's happening? Yeah, that's the main focus for the whole thing. Yep. And so that's going to be a definitely totally different than what people think jkd is <laughs> because they're not doing that uh, so what like we were talking about it's a situation you're going to be put in a situation you're going to be given some solutions and then you're going to have to try to work to make those solutions apply correct yeah yeah and uh, some pretty there's some pretty unconventional things that most people don't it's not stuff you see in the many other uh, you don't see it in any of the commercial type schools because this is more like uh it, more getting in the realm of survival work on you know on the ground i mean people don't think about you know you you get into it and the, the blade comes out and and you, you you both end up on the ground or the guy's attacking you while you're on the ground and a lot of folks don't address that kind of thing you know so we're, we're trying to, to cover all the environments that things happen in just like you do so this one's focused on that part i've been doing this knife workshops in a series you know and and this is just one block of the series so it doesn't matter if you've done the other ones or not, because this thing, each one kind of stands alone on what the emphasis is on. And this one's on the ground aspect. So anybody can, can do it, you know, or give it a shot. So This one's kind of uh, been attracted. Uh, I've got some law enforcement people too, because this is a thing that comes up and they're like, oh. Yeah, no. so it's open. It's open. What's that? No, it froze up a little bit. I think we're froze up. We are frozen. Audio is gone on your end for me. And we're back to uh, the videos locking the two. We are locked. I don't know if you can hear me at all. If you can hear me at all, give me a thumbs up. Nope, I guess you can't. Oh, you can. Yeah, I hear nothing. I can't hear a word you're saying. And, and uh, 
Okay, the, yeah, the video's semi okay, but I can't hear anything. I'm trying to see if there's something on my end. I'm not seeing anything. I don't know. We must have a funky satellite going on somewhere. Hmm. Bandwidth is good on my side, real good. It's about as high as it can get. I don't know. We might be uh, having to stop here. <laughs> hmm. Hey, wait a minute. 